Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to TheAnalysis.News. Please don't forget to subscribe and share and let people know what we're doing. I'll be back in just a few seconds with Eve Angler. We're going to continue discussions about his book, Stand On, Stand on Guard For Whom? About Canadian foreign and defense policy. NATO was established in 1949 when it's possible that some leaders of NATO member countries actually believed the Soviet Union was a military threat to Western Europe and North America. But it wasn't too many years later, certainly by the end of the Eisenhower administration, it was clear to Western intelligence and military leaders that there was a Soviet threat, but it wasn't military. It was the growing strength of national liberation movements across Asia, Africa, and Latin America that want an end to the colonial yoke, and, and from the new American empire as well. Soviet Union did provide some support and encouragement to these movements, and socialism in the USSR at least had the appearance of a better model for peoples for what were, was then called the Third World. The Soviet Revolution and then the Chinese Revolution had taken hundreds of millions of people out of the American-led global capitalism. Then General Eisenhower said it outright in a letter to a friend in 1947, significant portions of the world's population must live within a capitalist system if the U.S. system were to survive. That's Eisenhower in 1947. NATO's real mission wasn't to oppose a Soviet military threat. It was to contain movements for socialism within Western Europe and around the world, and to be part of the global American military industrial complex. Of course, all of this became a way to justify massive military budgets and profits for arms manufacturers. Perhaps that was NATO's paramount objective. For Canada, NATO membership meant compromising an independent foreign and defense policy for the sake of easy access to markets and arms sales to the U.S. As we discussed in our last interview segment with Eva Engler, President Kennedy helped Lester Pearson become prime minister in 1963 in a direct intervention into Canadian politics when then PM Diefenbaker refused placing nuclear armed missiles in Canada and supplying nuclear arms to Canadian troops in Europe unless the Canadian government had the final say on how they might be used. That amount of sovereignty was too much for Kennedy to accept. According to people who should know, NATO has set the policy of Canadian governments for decades. Here's a few quotes I found in Eve's book, Stand on Guard for Whom. This is in the chapter titled NATO Rules. Here's a quote. NATO has been the foundation of foreign policy of Canadian governments ever since it was formed in 1949 and will continue to be so. That's not from some lefty author or historian. It's Prime Minister Lester Pearson in 1963. Here's another quote from his book. NATO, in reality, had determined all of our defense policy. We had no defense policy, so to speak, except that of NATO. And our defense policy had determined all of our foreign policy. And we had no foreign policy of any importance except which flowed from NATO. That's not from a lefty historian either. That's from former Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau in 1969. So why did Canada submit to a NATO dominated by the U.S.? Because it was more profitable for the Canadian elites to do so. And of course, NATO has always been sold to Canadians as something that protected their sovereignty and freedom. The truth is quite the opposite. So I really recommend Eve's book. It's very important to see this argument fleshed out. And now Eve joins us again to discuss Stand On Guard For Whom. Eve is a Montreal-based activist and author. He has published 11 books, including House of Mirrors, Justin Trudeau's Foreign Policy. Thanks very much for joining me again, Eve. Thanks for having me. So talk about the origins of NATO, sort of the, the times, the, 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 what was at play, and, and what was Canada's role in all this? Well, uh, Canada played an important role in the establishment of NATO in 1947-48. Uh, um, some have suggested it was even a Canadian idea. But Canada, the U.S., and Britain were the three countries that had the uh, secret pre-establishment uh, of the organization. Um, 
meetings and uh and uh, lester pearson canada's then foreign affairs minister and later prime minister was right at the the heart of that process um, and I think that NATO was really established for two reasons. One was there was a fear of the um, of um, the left within Western Europe, um, most obviously in uh, Italy, where the left probably would have won if it wasn't for um, American uh, intervention, won elections. Uh, and uh, and so um, and also France, the Communist Party was major force. Um, uh, and so NATO was designed to sort of um, give bolster the the uh, spirit of elites in those countries who very much thought that, you know, communism was the way way of the future. Um, and Lester Pearson, Canada's foreign minister, was very open about this, that that NATO was uh, designed to um uh, deal with the threat from within, uh, within we within Western Europe, and stationing tens of thousands of uh, North American troops in Western Europe was designed to to uh, bolster uh, um, pro capitalist elite forces in, in in those countries. And then the other part of what NATO was about was about uh, bringing the uh, f the decolonizing world, um, uh, bolstering the colonial powers, and they did that through the 1950s with huge amounts of uh, Canadian weaponry was sent to the French while they were uh, repressing uh, independence movements in Algeria, the Belgians while they were repressing independence movements in the Congo. Um, and uh, uh, the British, while they were repressing independence movements in the Kenya, so it was designed to bolster the the uh, co uh, colonial powers that were uh, being challenged in Africa and elsewhere, but also to bring that world under uh, the decolonizing world under the geo the U.S. geopolitical umbrella. So bring primarily Britain um, under the uh, sort of the, the the lead the lead of the new uh, hegemon, which was obviously Washington. Uh, so Canada was right in the middle of that, and and Canadian uh, elites, obviously in a way that was subordinate to Washington, but people like Lester Pearson and other factions of uh, of the Canadian elite were generally uh, fine with that, and uh, and uh, even supportive of that, and and to a large extent um, that continues right up until today. So, you know, most of Canadian military policy today is a is a NATO military policy. And, you, you know, from well, the before before we get into that, let's go back to those you know late 40s and to the 50s, <clears throat> because it was in the name of defending European democracy that NATO was supposed to stop this, whether it was a Soviet uh, Invasion, that was the way it was mostly portrayed. There would be, you know, NATO was going to block the Western motion. But it was also uh, to, to suppress, and these, in your book, you mentioned even documents have come out where they talk about this overtly, uh, suppress this rise of the socialist movement in Europe, uh, the communist parties. And, and in fact, not only did they interfere in elections in Italy, and, 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 but they actually installed or propped up dictatorships in Greece for, for, for what was it, a decade and a half or two, in Spain and Portugal. I mean, in the, main, in the name of defending democracy, they're actually suppressing and manipulating voting and supporting outright police state dictatorships. Yeah, and 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 they there was the you know Operation Gladio where there was uh, you know st sort of stay behind forces that were uh, designed to discredit the left and to engage in sort of uh, acts of violence to to discredit the left. Um, yeah, I mean the the like I said, Lester Pearson was very open. He has a speech which I've quoted in a few places where where. Uh, in the House of Commons, where he talks about how the communists, if we just if we don't establish NATO and we just let let the po politics play out as it was playing out, that the the communists were like taking over the kindergartens. He literally, you know, refers to it. They talks about the kindergartens; they're taking over every institution. And he wasn't talking about um, Moscow. It was understood. Canadian officials at this point understood that after World War II, that. I mean, 25 million, 27 million people in uh, Russia uh, in the, you know, had died during during World War Two. It was, you know, completely destroyed. They wanted Moscow wanted uh, uh, a defensive 
uh, kind of arrangement where they wanted the countries in their in their sphere to be uh, not you know uh, directed against them, but they they the they wanted basically a defensive arrangement. They understood that that Moscow was not going to be, mar- you know, Soviet or R- Russian and Soviet troops were not going to be marching into Italy to take over Italy. They they understood that was obvious. Um, so so they they um, you know they, it was it was always a offensive arrangement. And you know right away in 1950. When uh, twenty seven thousand Canadian troops are are sent to uh, Korea alongside you know hundreds of thousands of of, of u s. troops, um, Lester Pearson and top American officials uh, justified one of their justifications uh, in invading Korea and turning what was basically a, you know a civil war into a a horror story of three or four million people dying was NATO, and that we have to basically NATO justified you know American military advancement everywhere in the globe, everywhere across the globe. Um, so from this from the get go, it was uh, it was an you know an expansive um, uh, uh, arrangement, um, and uh, you know the rhetoric of of you know protecting Canada from you know Russian invasion, it, you know it didn't make sense then, uh, it doesn't make sense today, but it but it has been um, uh, I think fairly effective in um, in convincing uh, the public to uh, to uh, support. Uh, the organization. You know, I've been reading recently a, a, a paper. I'll try to put a reference up maybe in the transcript, uh, sort of a breakdown of Eisenhower's public pronouncements and his private policy and private communication in the late 1940s, uh, before he's president, where he's actually publicly talking about cooperation with the Soviet Union, how it's possible to have a kind of peaceful coexistence. But in his private correspondence. He's, he's very clear that there really is a threat, and it's clear it's not military. It's a threat that countries are going to want to be socialist, and the socialist movements are going to win in various parts of the world and leave this American capitalist system. Uh, there's nowhere he suggests there's an actual Soviet military threat, either in Europe or anywhere else. Um, and, 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 uh, you know, I, I have a thing up on my website now, an interview I did with Gore Vidal. He said Truman and Eisenhower really understood all this. He said Kennedy, he thought, and he knew Kennedy, actually believed some of this Cold War stuff, that there really was a military threat. And I guess by Kennedy's time, the Soviet Union was a far stronger military, militarily. But it's clear even then, during the Kennedy years, it was all defensive posture. And at the level of, of nuclear weapons, the United States had far more nuclear weapons and far was more far more capable of first strike uh, than the Soviet. And the Soviet Union never had any intention of, of first strike, and that's become clear in all the historical documents. Uh, so I, I think it's very important that this whole thing of NATO is to defend the Western elites. It's got nothing to do with defending people's national security. And, as, and then you get Canada, who's so much part of this militarism, then starts portraying itself as if it's the, you know, the great peacekeeper and peacenik of the world. But, but go on in terms of how this NATO determines Canadian uh, defense and then foreign policy, the way Trudeau calls it, although it's, he went along with it himself in the end. Well, I mean, just to take a concrete example from that time, the most famous thing that Lester Pearson is known for is establishing um, UN peacekeeping, the the Suez Crisis in 1956, and 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 so you know he's now lauded as this sort of you know peace Nick. Uh, in that case, at that point, he was the external minister and later prime minister. Um, but Pearson was very clear that his objective with the peacekeeping force in Egypt in 1956 was that the British, French, and Israelis had invaded Egypt. Washington opposed the invasion. Washington opposed the invasion for two reasons. One, they were concerned that that would uh, add to Moscow's prestige in a region that was sort of up up in the air and there was a there was sort of a decolonizing process taking place. Uh, so if they didn't oppose the invasion, that would that would lead this sort of uh, newly independent Arab countries to go more in Moscow's direction. But the other reason Washington opposed the invasion uh, was that they wanted to tell the former colonial powers, 
France and uh, and uh, the UK, there was a new boss in the region, and that of course was was the US. And so they opposed the invasion. They put actually put a lot of pressure on uh, on Britain. They cut off uh, IMF supports to to Britain at that time, and. Lester Pearson establishes the peacekeeping mission in negotiation, discussion with uh, John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State. Um, and the Americans uh, talk about sending, you know, flying the, the peacekeepers there. And it's basically a way to ex extract Britain from what becomes a disastrous invasion and what, what le which is leading to tension within NATO, right? That, that now Washington and London are not aligned, and that's a big problem for, for, for NATO. So the point of the peacekeeping mission in Egypt in 56, which has now been mythologized into Lester Pearson trying to help the poor children of, of, of Egypt, was all about dealing with a conflict within NATO. Um, so that's, you know, you know, one concrete example, obviously the, the uh, thousands of Canadian troops that get uh, deployed to Western Europe stationed there, then they get, you know, nuclear weapons on the Canadian uh, uh, fighter jets that are, that are stationed there um, until right up, right up until today, you know, when you look at Canadian military policy today, well, there's Canadian NATO lead a NATO mission in 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 Latvia. About 500 Canadians, uh, one of four NATO missions on right around uh, Russia's doorstep. Uh, there's Canadian NATO uh, training mission uh, in Iraq. Um, um, so you know, Canada's um, uh, naval vessels are constantly uh, uh, part of and sometimes leading uh, NATO um, um, armadas, uh, uh, be it in uh, one point uh, circumnavigating Africa, uh, be it in uh, in the uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, uh, um, uh, the Black Sea. Didn't, didn't the Canadian general command the NATO aircraft uh, bombing Libya? Of course, yeah, yeah. There was a Canadian uh, Boucher who who led the whole bombing of Libya in 2011, uh, and there was also Canadian uh, fighter jets and uh, naval vessels that were that were part of that. So, so you know, Canadian foreign policy is is uh, I, I, I you know uh, Jack Granitstein, who's a uh, you know staunch militarist historian in 2020 2007 he said which i quote alongside those other quotes he said that 90 percent of canadian defense policy over, over the past 50 years was was you know nato and and i think he's correct and that that's the overwhelming thrust um of canadian uh uh defense policy which of course is you know preeminent when it comes i to think i think it was policy. defense resources wasn't it this, yeah, exactly. Ninety percent defense resources uh, devoted to devoted to NATO. Um, so, so that's you know when it comes to the the equipment that the Canadian military purchases, right? Where they're now trying to buy these fighter jets for nineteen billion dollars up front and and seventy seven billion dollars over the life cycle. Uh, that's to be able to fight in NATO. Uh, war. Same thing with the huge uh, naval uh, vessel procurement, which is $82 billion for 15 naval vessels. That's going to be 286 estimate of $286 billion over its life cycle. Um, again, that's, that's uh, you know, four NATO wars and the, the whole interoperability. Uh, it's not just NATO wars. I think it would say NATO and U.S. led wars because sometimes Canada has participated in, uh, like recently, in bombing of uh, Syria in 2014 to 2016. That was a Canada-U.S. Uh, uh, mission. Um, but uh, you know the Canadian uh, uh, weaponry is purchased to be interoperable with the U.S. and uh, and uh, and uh, NATO. Um, um, uh, forces. Um, so in the new in the new naval vessels that we're purchasing, um, the radar they have uh, Tomahawk missiles that can go fifteen hundred kilometers, um, and uh, and uh, the radars allow uh, U.S. <laughs> officials to uh, to fire the, those uh, missiles from uh, from Canadian uh, uh, naval vessels. Um, uh, so so Canadian foreign policy or Canadian military policy is you know completely. Uh, subordinate to NATO uh, US um, uh, directives. Uh, talk a little bit more about this jet aircraft purchase. Uh, am I correct that they're now capable of carrying tactical nuclear weapons, these jets? I, mean, I don't see, think Canada has signed on to that yet, but it's something those jets are capable of. 
They are, and the the, the likely the, the the purchase is not does uh, the Saab Gripen and the uh, and the uh, Lockheed Martin's F thirty five. The decision is supposed to be made sometime in uh, the start of. Uh, uh, next year, um, but yes, the F thirty five has been marketed as being able to to uh, um, a B six uh, one, uh, I think it is, nuclear uh, uh, missile, um, and uh, and uh, the this is one of the issues. Uh, the fighter jet purchase is probably the the, the main issue that the anti war forces in this country are uh, are organizing around to oppose. Uh, the fighter jet purchase. Um, there was a big, uh, major public letter in the summertime that was signed by people like Neil Young and uh, um, uh, Roger Waters and uh, Noam Chomsky and a whole bunch of Canadian, uh, David Suzuki, Naomi Klein, Canadian celebrities um, opposing uh, the fighter jet uh, purchase, um, which is, um, you know, they, they they try to claim it's about you know defending Canada, but but these fighter jets are really about uh, being able to uh, engage uh, uh, with uh, the U.S. and uh, and NATO forces, um, and it's a big uh, uh, the criticism of the fighter jets not just that it's you know used to, to kill people and bomb people and to uh, in, in increase uh, U.S. militarism around the world. But also that th- this money should be devoted to um, to real security, which is which is um, you know dealing with a global pandemic, which is uh, dealing with the climate crisis, and you're putting you know seventy seven billion dollars into uh, heavy carbon emitting fighter jets when that money could go into uh, you know building uh, light rail lines uh, across the country could be going into uh, building the infrastructure that's needed to transition off of uh, off of fossil fuels. Um, but the but the uh, the priorities of the military and the priorities of of NATO uh, take precedence over you know real uh, the real uh, security threats uh, facing Canadians. And how directly do you think is the sort of pressure that the Americans put, frankly, on all the NATO countries uh, to spend a certain portion of their GDP on uh, on quote unquote defense on military expenditures? Uh, and, and, you know, Trump was very loud about that, but I think every president has tried to push the NATO countries to spend more. To some extent, certainly in the Canadian situation, but Europe as well, and, and, and I think it probably drives a lot of NATO expansion into Eastern Europe, which is embroiling those countries in arms purchases. I was just reading today, I, have, I haven't verified this number yet, but apparently Georgia spends about $2 billion a year, the country Georgia, on arms purchases, almost entirely American, uh, in a, a tiny country with a small GDP. I mean, two billions a year is a lot of a lot of money. Um, this is kind of a way to pay homage to uh, or subservience or whatever the proper word for it is to the United States that you have to buy a certain amount of arms from them. I mean, for sure. I mean, the whole interoperability uh, is designed to um, have. Canadian taxpayers uh, pay for, you know, U.S. weaponry. Um, the F-35 is a, you know, prime example of that, where, where, um, uh, you know, countries around the world are, are, you know, purchasing the fighter jets from Lockheed Martin. There's a certain amount of, uh, of uh, work that's done uh, um, by uh, companies around the world. I have to say in that case, Canadian firms are often a kind of beneficiary of that or Canada's whole uh, arms industry is really a overwhelmingly is branch plant of US uh, arms industry, right? So they've, they going back, you know, 50 plus years, they've been uh, producing uh, within Canada. Sometimes they're, they're, they even have, you know, global operations that produce from Canada where they, they export uh, significant amounts from Canada, but it's, you know, General Dynamics Canada, it's Lockheed Martin Canada, it's Boeing uh, 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 Canada. Um, so, so uh, there's no doubt that um, the, the the U.S. military gets a a uh, they have to basically they have to sign off on the Canadian um, uh, fighter jet purchase. Uh, I can't, I'm forgetting the exact wording that that that's used, but they basically have to sign off. So, so right now it's a competition between a Swedish uh, a jet and a, uh, a, a American jet, and the the likelihood of the Canadian military choosing the Swedish jet is is almost nil 
because they had need to sign off uh, the American elite needs to sign off through because of NORAD um, uh, but also uh, because um, uh, there the, the there's just you know the the whole structure of the Canadian military the the uh, the military uh, leaders you know one of the things they do after retiring is they go work for these uh, for arms companies which are Lockheed Martin Canada, which are General Dynamics Canada, uh, Boeing Canada, they're, they're branch plants of uh, of the U.S. military industrial complex. So that puts that just adds a a level of of uh, their own you know, sort of self interest tied into into this uh, uh, process. But but the the American government uh, clearly views every uh, added dollar in Canadian military spending as uh, enhancing their um, the U.S. war machine. I mean, at, the, at both levels, the level of the Canadian military supports uh, U.S. militarism around the world, be it you know different missions, be it uh, naval vessels uh, patrolling in the South China Sea with alongside U.S. Uh, destroyers, um, but also at the level uh, at the corporate level of uh, the spending. Uh, most of it goes to U.S. arms manufacturers. Sometimes often with their branch branch plants within Canada uh, but in one way or another they, those are US uh, US corporations so so you find that uh be it Barack Obama when he speaks in the in Canada he pressures the Canadian government to increase military spending Donald Trump uh, back at George W Bush's ambassador he he said that there was only one mandate he had when he uh, got appointed Canadian ambassador uh, ambassador US ambassador in Ottawa was to uh, increase Canadian military spending to pressure the Canadian government to increase uh, 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 military spending so um, there is no doubt that the uh, the you know Washington and the the U.S. Empire uh, views uh, Canadian military spending and and the the main stick that is used is this claim that as a member of NATO you're supposed to pay two percent of GDP uh, spend two percent of GDP on on the military but that's just a number that's you know like literally pulled from 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 thin air right I mean there's no uh, necessary rationale for that number. Uh, it doesn't include, I mean, Canada, there's only one country that's a threat to Canada. Uh, that's the U.S., right? But yet, the you know, Canada is is uh, is supporting uh, uh, U.S.'s uh, um, uh, military uh, uh, policy around the world. Um, so, so um, NATO becomes uh, important in sort of justifying uh, increased uh, increased military spending that uh, that Washington's pushing. Uh, you would think the first point or principle of having an armed force is to defend the sovereignty of the country. Um, but there's examples in your book where, where the Canadian military uh, are sometimes, in terms of chain of command, more tied into the chain of command towards up the command to the American armed forces and, and American civilian leadership than the Canadian civilian leadership. Yeah, I mean, 2003 with the invasion of Iraq, Canadian military leaders tried to um, basically uh, push the government into a situation where they where they uh, supported the war. Uh, uh, ultimately, the government doesn't does, doesn't provide political support for the war, but provides a whole bunch of different um, uh, types of support uh, f for the U.S. invasion. Um, in terms of uh, there was one uh, initiative in. 2013, the uh, CBC reported on that uh, the top echelon of the Canadian military, uh, working with American counterparts, uh, almost uh, try to create some form of. Uh, it's a little bit unclear, but almost like a uh, a joint force that got to, that political leadership had to had to curtail. You go back to the establishment of of NORAD in, in the mid 1950s. And it's the military basically coming to an agreement, the Canadian military coming to an agreement with the U.S. military that is then pushed on uh, uh, the the new uh, John Diefenbaker uh, 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 government, um, so that they basically uh, tie the tie the new government's hands to have to, to have to have to agree to that accord. So there's example after example in the history of of of, um, of Canadian. Um, 
uh, military history in the past, uh, at least since the end of World War II, where the military is trying to deepen integration with the U.S. military, while the political leadership is is uh, is sort of uh, reluctant or trying to uh, slow down those those uh, uh, that that uh, integration. Now, there is a whole debate that I don't think is is had enough uh, on the why question of why the Canadian military is so is so supportive of of deepening integration. I, I don't I don't uh, uh, agree with this idea that the Canadian military is just the sort of lackeys of the U.S. I, I think there's an element of that, but I think that from the Canadian military's perspective, uh, first of all, the U.S. is the the major force pushing to increase Canadian military spending, which they of course like, and the more spending on the military, the better. Um, there's all these connections between Canadian military uh, officials and uh, arms manufacturers, which are primarily U.S. arms manufacturers in Canada. Uh, but also, they get they get uh, opportunities. Canadian military uh, they get opportunities to uh, engage in international missions that is, you know, unique. So, for instance, uh, Walter Nattingzink, who later becomes the chief of the defense staff, the the top Canadian military official, he led thirty five thousand uh, international troops in Iraq. So Canada technically never went to war in Iraq, but uh, Nadezik helped plan the war uh, beforehand because he was on assignment uh, uh, training at a U.S. Uh, military college. And then he gets to lead 35,000 troops in Iraq. From a, a general's perspective, that's a pretty pretty good score. Um, uh, so so the Canadian military uh, gets all kinds of opportunities that they wouldn't get. And then additionally... Um, the American military treats the Canadian military in a way that's, you know, uniquely um, uh, sympathetic, and uh, even even if even comparing it to, you know, the German military, is the history of uh, there was a accord with the Canadian uh, fighter jets in in Europe, uh, based in Germany, that had uh, U.S. nuclear weapons on them. The Americans didn't want the Germans to know the agreement they had with Canada because the agreement was so, uh, so, you know, uh, cozy with Canada versus the agreement they had with, with the Germans. Other examples of, you know, cleaning up, um, uh, military bases. Uh, and at one point in the mid 1990s, the U S Congress, uh, there was an agreement, I believe the, between the Pentagon and, uh, and Ottawa to uh, deal with some, uh, a, a military base, but the U S Congress steps in because they're concerned that this might become a model for all the American military bases all around the world, and then the U.S. would be on the hook for all kinds of you know cleanup that they wouldn't want to wouldn't want to uh, cover. So the the history is that the Canadian military gets treated um, even more so, better than you know the British uh, and others uh, by the U.S. military. So so I think that to to just describe it as U.S. or Canadian military officials as just being lackeys of the U.S. is a little a little too uh, um, simplistic. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, one, as I said in my introduction, it's primarily driven because the elites make money out of all this. Uh, and, and it's not only the uh, direct arms manufacturers, but as it is in the U.S., Canadian financial institutions in various forms have a lot of ownership positions in the Canadian military industrial complex. So there's money to be made there. And the second thing is I don't think we should rule out NATO and the culture of the Canadian military and U.S. and most of Europe, but they really are the products of the Cold War, and and a lot of the uh, soldiers as they you know train and join at lower ranks and rise through the ranks, uh, they are themselves become the products of that Cold War view of the world, that you know that there is going to be another Hitler and we're going to defend you know, Canada from this. Hitler and, you know, the Hitler might be the Soviets or the Russians or the Chinese. And, you know, the idea of the external military threat, I think it's quite internalized. So it's not like it's all just cynical money making or just being puppets of the Americans. There's there's just I mean, if you want to call it brainwashing, you could, because uh, that is kind of what boot camp and military culture is all about. A part of preparing soldiers to kill people and get killed. Uh, for what? For freedom? Uh, against what? The enemy. But, you know, what was the enemy uh, that Canadians or uh, so many Americans have died for? Uh, and the, uh, the, other, the other piece where I'm agreeing with you about this, you can't just see the Canadian military 
as puppets, part of that institutional culture is the strengthening of the institution and its culture because people become, they personify that culture, they become that culture. So the bigger the budget, the more armaments they have, the more toys they have, the more uh, wars and interventions they get to be part of, the more relevant they feel. You know, you know they're, they're actually doing something in the world. I mean, it always kills me uh, metaphorically because it's literal for the people I'm about to talk about that soldiers want to often go fight in these wars until they get there. You know, after a few years in Afghanistan and Iraq, a lot of soldiers changed their mind about how wonderful it was to actually go fight. But up until that point, they're like licking their lips because that's what they've been trained to want to, you know, fight and kill. So it's also in terms of their own identity. It's not just the Americans are telling them what to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I quote a couple uh, uh, the Jackson Chief of Defense staff, I believe in 2013, where Canada's uh, withdrawing from Iraq or from Afghanistan. And he says, um, he calls for another war. He says, you know, we've had that people of uh, uh, men and women of the force have, have had that bumper sticker. We want it. We want another, we want another one. Um, a couple other examples I cite in the book. And, and I think another element to the, the, the cultural uh, element to understanding Canadian uh, military uh, policy and being uh, aligned with the U.S. Empire is that the Canadian military's roots are in empire, right? It's the, the British Empire, and it's the force that conquered uh, what is now, uh, you know, Canada, Turtle Island, um, and and it's always been a uh, a force of empire. I think there's a racist element to that. I think there's a, a white supremacist element to that, um, and and it. It it went. It was a you know really um, a fluid uh, move from being a force aligned with the British Empire, the main conquering power, uh, to being a force aligned with the U.S. Empire. And and in fact, there's one uh, a study that that actually talked to the uh, that interviewed the um, top leadership of uh, of five navies that that have it have their roots with the with the british military uh indian uh south african uh, uh argentinian canadian and australian and the uh indian south african and Ar argentinian their naval leadership v viewed themselves as sort of like a major regional force the Canadian and Australian, they viewed themselves as part of this great uh, international uh, 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 Navy force uh, that had a presence all around the globe. Basically, they viewed themselves as aligned with the American empire and its you know, global mandate to you know, control the whole world, whereas those three other countries uh, 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 didn't. Um, so, so, so at the level of the you know, individual leaderships, uh, individuals leading leading the different parts of the uh, Canadian military, they you know view themselves as part of this um, this great uh, worldly force, and that's been the case you know effectively for the whole time Canada has existed. Initially, as a the great worldly force was the uh, the British Empire, and today it's uh, it's the it's the U.S. Empire. So those. Those uh, ideologies are, are are deeply held uh, within within the force, and it's and it, and and like you said as well, you know the military is just one uh, institutional part of, of many other facets to Canadian political life that are also oriented in the same way, and that the you know the general uh, the leadership of Canadian corporations and the capitalist class in this country, they also you know view the world and profit from the world in a very similar way to the to the uh, the the corporate set in 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 the US. Um, and uh, and so that that you know it's just one um, I think it's it's probably the among the more among the mo most pro American institutions, major institutions within Canada, but it's just one of uh, one of many. All right. Thanks a lot, Eve. We're going to talk to Eve again uh, sometime soon uh, about some other chapters of this book, uh, Stand on Guard for Home. I, again, I urge you to get it. Just one last question, Eve. Uh, if, if people actually want to do something, uh, what's a, what, what can they do? 
Well, there is a there is a growing peace movement around the fighter jet issue specifically. Uh, there's a no fighter jet campaign, uh, nofighterjets.ca. Uh, I'm also uh, active uh, with the uh, uh, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Uh, um, foreignpolicy.ca is our website. Uh, pe- people can sign up for the uh, for the newsletter. Um, uh, but in most uh, most uh, uh, decent sized uh, cities across the country, there is a uh, some uh, uh, peace organization like the um, Canadian Peace uh, Congress chapters across the country. Most places, it's usually small, but uh, World Beyond War um, uh, has a number of Canadian chapters that people can uh, can get active with. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. Excuse my voice. I don't know why it's so croaky, but whatever. Um, Please don't forget that if you can support us financially, that would be great. Uh, Please subscribe, please share, and all of that stuff. Thanks again.